Hello and welcome back or welcome to the channel. I'm Loudguns and having slept for a good half day to recover, I think I'm finally ready to try and catch up on all things CitizenCon. I was really impressed by a bunch of the things CIG unveiled at the annual convention and realistically it's going to take a bit of time to unpack it all, go back over and re-watch some of the presentations and then distill them into more videos. So that's probably going to keep me busy over the next couple of weeks at least. What I did want to do was pick out some of my personal highlights from the show. The emphasis here, my personal highlights. We all love SC for different reasons, and that's one of the things that makes it cool. So feel free to tell me what your highlights were down in the comments. When I started making this video, it snowballed a little bit, but I managed to boil it down to 12 points. I also decided it would probably be best to break it down into two parts with six in each. So if this all sounds good to you, then grab a cup of tea while I roll the intro, then let's get into it. Just before we begin, I want to give a massive shout out to everyone at the Frontier community for making our CitizenCon watch party a great time. The lunchtime events in particular were great, and congratulations to Karmatan for taking home the Drake Cutter Scout, and Master Ben 10 for winning the Fury LX in our screenshot competition. If you're looking to get more involved with multiplayer gameplay in Star Citizen, please pop in and join us via the Discord link in the video description. With that said, let's start taking a look at the highlights which, I stress, are in no particular order. So having said that this is my personal list, I'd like to make it clear that I don't generally fall into the tech watcher camp when it comes to Star Citizen. I work in finance, and we're like crocodiles. Microsoft Excel was as good as it needed to get, so we just stopped evolving. So since most of the tech in SC goes over my head, the technical presentations don't tend to be my favourite aspect of sitcoms. But the Star Engine demo did blow me away. And one of the big concerns that's been banded around about SC is that the tech risks being out of date before the game is even released. But to a complete layman, what was shown in this demo was on par with what I've seen out of the likes of Unreal 5. There was a lot crammed into this presentation and we're on a whistle stop tour, so I just want to focus on a couple of things that I think will really impact gameplay. Firstly, destructible environments. This should create a lot of variety in terms of how we can handle certain situations, and maybe unintended consequences too. For instance, bombing an entrenched ground opponent with your shiny new A1 might seem like the best course of action, but you might unintentionally create a haven for snipers and ambushes. Second, it's got to be server meshing. Now I'm sure there are a lot of content creators and some of you out there who are going to be able to 100% understand how all of this works and you could provide an excellent deep dive on it. All I really know is that server meshing was one of the biggest tech hurdles standing in the way of SC, and that it appears to be a problem that the developers have solved. I always like to keep my expectations on the low side, but dare I say that this could spell the end for the dreaded 30k in time. And secondly, we've got access to Pyro. So the lucky attendees got to be the first to enter the Pyro system on a bank of PCs set up on the show floor, but looks like the rest of us won't be too far behind with the announcement of a new preview channel. The Pyro is going to be available on the preview channel, opening up on Tuesday the 31st of October, with a randomised selection of concierge backers, the most active testers, and those who bought the digital goodies pack. Just to be clear, because I know not everyone reads the fine print, buying the digital goodies pack does not guarantee you will make it into the first wave. It just gets your name in the hat. With that aside though, I think this is fantastic. Not only because I'm really looking forward to getting into Pyro, but also because I think Star Citizen in general will benefit from having this special preview channel for other new features, some of which we'll come on to in a bit. That being said, I still really think CIG need to consider how to motivate players to hang out in preview and PTU environments, as opposed to playing on live where they might feel they get more sense of progression. You can have all the testing channels you like, but if you've got no testers, they don't really help. So I know I'm not meant to play favourites, but screw it. When Thorson gets on stage, I know that we're going to hear about the thing that matters the most to me in Star Citizen, tangible gameplay. 
and while we'd already seen previews of the engineering system, this was a much more in-depth presentation. I think it does raise a question that's almost certainly going to become a full video just by itself. What does this mean for multi-crew? Or maybe more specifically, what does it mean for solo players? In the demo, the guys were operating a Hercules, and in order to keep all their systems up and running, required an engineer operating the console and providing updates on which capacitors and parts needed servicing, along with other players to actually go and effect the repairs. All of a sudden, you're not just having to factor in having an engineer on larger ships, but rather an engineering team. Personally, I love it. And I know that with some of the experiments we've been running within Frontier, it's become increasingly clear to us just how many people large and capital sized ships are going to take to run effectively. I also know that for solo pilots, this might be concerning. The good news is that CIG did bring up NPC crew again, but realistically I think engineering gameplay and the accompanying risks of systems failures are going to come into game before AI crew makes it. Hopefully solo players and small crews will be able to work around some of these issues by keeping their ships well oiled, taking the time during longer QT jumps to carry out maintenance, and maybe paying a premium for parts that are just less likely to break. However, realistically maybe this will push smaller groups into smaller ships, providing a reward for those who put the time and effort into working together. As ever, I won't be the one to tell you what to do with your money, I would strongly advise anyone thinking of buying a capital ship at this year's IAE to watch this part of Sitcon and ask yourself if you have the crewmates to keep that ship running. But speaking of ships, the newly unveiled Zeus Mark II, with its recommended crew size of 3, might be a lot more manageable. In game lore, the original Zeus was an early design from RSI, and the Mark II represents a version that's been brought up to the standards of the modern age. The reception this got, at least at our watch party, was decidedly mixed. There'd been a few leaks so people knew to expect something like this. I think some would have preferred to own a relic, even if that meant it wasn't necessarily competitive with other ships. Now for me, I'm just really liking this design, and I think more ships with a crew of three is a really good thing for the game. For our side, these might seem a bit strange since they've already got the Connie series, I think the Zeus are more likely in direct competition with Drake Cutlasses and Misc Freelancers. The Zeus Mark II comes in three variants. The ES, or Essential, is the standard variant with a focus on exploration. It benefits from enhanced shielding and scanning capabilities. The CL Hauler variant sacrifices some of the ES's shielding and scanning capabilities for a tractor beam mounting and more cargo space. The hold offers 128 SCU versus the ES's 32 SCU. Having spent a lot of time moving boxes recently though, I think something CIG could do with is visualising for us the uh, actual shape of the cargo holds. For instance, 128 SCU could allow you to take four of the largest 32 SCU crates, but the shape of the ship might not accommodate that cargo in that way. And finally, we've got my favourite variant, the MR Security variant. This seems to be a direct competitor to Drake's Cutlass Blue, with onboard space sacrificed for prisoner transport and an onboard armory, as well as a QED device and EMP for tackling and shutting down your bounty targets. Understandably, the MR also brings more weaponry to the fight with an additional turret versus the other variants. I'm particularly excited about the Bounty Hunter, since elsewhere in the presentations we saw a demo of restraints. So I really hope we're going to see the long-awaited development of the bounty hunting game loop, with more of a focus on the alive part of Dead or Alive. As ever with concept ships, there are a lot of unknowns, but my first thoughts are that the Zeus looks to offer more than the equivalent freelancers or cutlasses, without increasing the crew count. And this sort of progression in terms of quality of ships is just as important as simply ship size, particularly in light of the multi-crew point we've just covered. So I've been jumping out of ships a lot recently, and while I've generally got the hang of it, the UVA mechanics in Star Citizen are a bit of a weak point. Last year at Sitcom we got a bit of a teaser of improvements to UVA, but this year they firmed this up a lot. And one of the really big changes is in terms of the default positioning of your character in UVA. Right now we kind of bob around in an upright position, but going forward the stance is moving to prone. This might not seem like a huge change on the surface, but it's going to mean that you're piloting your character in EVA in a manner much more similar to flying a ship. 
It should also mean that squeezing through gaps when exploring a derelict wreck or the exterior of a station should be smoother and more intuitive. I'm particularly looking forward to what the Frontier Racing guys cook up in terms of an EVA racecourse. The devs also showed how we should be able to directly interact with surfaces and handholds, hopefully allowing for more push-pull mechanics, which might come in handy if we have to start considering fuel. It could also allow us to stabilise ourselves in space more easily. Okay, so let's round off the first half with a huge one, base building. As you may know, I am a bit of a survival game addict, so the moment base building gets mentioned, my interest immediately gets piqued. And while this was a relatively short presentation, I am telling myself as much as anyone not to get too hyped, Todd Pappy did manage to cram a whole lot of new information into it. Don't worry, this is 100% getting a dedicated video shortly. But let's start with the thing he saved to the end. CIG is starting development, working on land claiming and base building in Q1 of 2024. So while this will undoubtedly take some time, it's at least going to be underway. This is where I'd go back to that new preview channel, because something I've wondered about for a while is how we could get an environment to test out base building mechanics in the PU. Potentially the preview test environment could actually be used to facilitate this. The team are also thinking really clearly about risk and reward in all of this. Todd broke it down into three location categories. High security areas will require a land claim, give you full protection including base invulnerability and NPC security, but comes at the cost of low potential rewards and high taxes and fees. Dropping to low security will still require a land claim and affords you partial protection from NPCs, although you importantly lose that base invulnerability. On the upside, you should have better potential rewards and lower taxes and fees. Then finally, we have Nullsec, which removes the need to have an official land claim, and you won't have any taxes or fees to pay. On top of that, you'll find the highest potential rewards in these areas. But of course, you are on your own. Your base is fully destructible, and your defence is your own issue to deal with. As far as I'm concerned, this is perfection, and balances the desire of solo players and small groups to have a safe place to call home, alongside creating a highly competitive endgame for larger organisations. Todd also went into building vehicles a little bit, with a small hover surveyor designed to build small buildings, a ground vehicle for small and medium sized buildings, a surprise announcement that the RSI Galaxy will fit the gap to produce large buildings and dam, though I assume we're going to see a new construction module for that ship in the future, and finally the Pioneer is still the daddy, with the ability to build everything including XL structures. Mr. Pappy risked getting me to max hype status by mentioning that they were exploring space options. Please CRG, if you let me build a secret asteroid hideout, I promise to never ask John Crew about the status of the Endeavour ever again. And while there's way more to go into, the last thing which I would really focus in on here were the comments about fabrication or manufacturing. Because something that I didn't think CIG were going to consider was mentioned. We've known about plans to introduce a blueprint system for manufacturing for a while, but Todd included ship manufacturing in his list. And even if we're limited to some degree in what we can build, the idea of playing controlled ship factories has me huffing at my hopium dispenser. So as you can probably tell, it was after I excitedly typed far too many words on the base building section that I decided this would probably be best done as a two-parter. So I'm aiming for part two to release tomorrow, so if you want to keep up with my latest content, please feel free to hit the subscribe button. I hope that if you missed Sitcom this year, or if you watched it and maybe missed a few bits, I've inspired you to go back and re-watch some of the VODs of the presentations. There was a serious amount in there, and it's really reminded me why I love this game and the community around it so much. And while I know there are definitely ups and downs following along with the project, I think my actual number one highlight was just how happy it makes me to see a developer pushing the boundaries of what's possible, as opposed to making just another cookie cutter experience. With all that said, I'd just like to say thank you very much for watching all the way to the end, and I look forward to seeing you next time.